Hi, I'm Elliot Chu. I'm the Interim Dean for the College of Science. I'm J.P. Jones, and I'm the Don Bennett Moon Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. The two colleges are really excited to bring this lecture series to you. This lecture series is centered on the COVID-19 pandemic, both the past, present, and future of where this pandemic is leaving us. The two colleges are really excited to bring you fresh perspectives that emerge from combining the insights of both social science and scientific scholars. This pandemic has wrecked havoc on global health, economies, exposed systematic inequalities, disrupted family and personal relationships, and frankly, disrupted our understanding of time and place. This pandemic is gonna have an enormous impact on every aspect of our daily lives. So we've decided to create three conversations. The first conversation will be between a geneticist and a historian, and they're going to discuss the pathways that pandemics have taken throughout history and how this one is impacting our lives. The second lecture will be between um, a compassion expert and an audiologist. And they're gonna be talking about both empathy and compassion and how that can help us get through this amazingly difficult time. And the third conversation will be between a biologist and a communications expert who are gonna talk about how human perception and behavior can help fight this pandemic. And this program will be hosted and moderated by Nancy Montoya, an award-winning journalist and reporter with the UA Marketing and Communications team. Nancy's worked with PBS, CNN, NBC, AZPM, and she's an SBS graduate of the School of Journalism. Thank you, Nancy, for doing this for us. And thank also Mike and Beth Kasser and Paulula Companies for their financial support. Thank you, JP. We're really excited that both of our colleges can partner to bring you this conversation. I hope it's informative and also very much helpful during this very challenging time. From the campus of the University of Arizona, thank you for joining us for a three-part series of special conversations centered around our lives during the COVID-19 pandemic. What we know now, what history has taught us, and perhaps what lessons we have that might help us navigate our way today. I'm Nancy Montoya, a longtime journalist here in Arizona, and I will be the moderator for the next three series. This is a joint venture between two colleges here at the university that at first seem like they don't have a lot in common. Perhaps they operate on two different disciplines. But if you look closer, you'll find that there is a lot they have in common. On one side is the College of Science, and across campus is a College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Today, we have with us Emma Perez, Dr. Emma Perez. Emma is a research social scientist in the Southwest Center. She describes herself as a Chicana feminist, a historian, and a writer who examines how big events change history and how we remember them. Now, across campus, again, uh, in the College of Science, we'll be talking with Michael Warabi. Michael is a man of science. He's a geneticist. I believe, Michael, you gained some worldwide recognition for your work on viral pandemics, including some of the current things that we're facing today. Straight away, first question for both of you. Uh, what do a geneticist, Michael, and a historian, Emma, uh, have in common when it comes to the COVID-19 virus? That's a really good question. I know that um, as an historian, as a Chicanx, Latinx historian, I think that there are, certainly there's always commonalities with, with the sciences. I come out of the social sciences and humanities. But I think the, the commonalities is just wanting to understand the implications of what this is socially behaviorally, right? And I think certainly a geneticist gives us the kinds of facts that um, historians seek and that are up for interpretation. So I think for me, it's, it's of course, I mean, there's always that balance. There's always that uh, informing of each other. I think I really believe in transdisciplinarity too and having various disciplines inform each other and talk to each other more. I think we don't do that enough. I agree, and I'm very pleased to be on with a, with a historian. Uh, I actually did uh, a minor in history when I was doing my biology degree, and I've always um, sort of kept 
a foot in the historical uh, uh, side of things with my own research. And my own research uses the gene sequences of things like this new virus or Spanish flu from 1918 or HIV um, to essentially try to work out the history of when, where, and how pandemics start, spread around the world, um, end up sort of emerging in particular parts of the world or particular uh, populations more than others. And so it's very much a, a historical science. Uh, so I, I see myself as doing uh, similar work just from records that are captured in the A's, C's, G's, and T's of genome sequences rather than in uh, paper records or other documents. Wow, Michael, you did some research, didn't you, on the uh, pandemic earlier in the 1918s, 1919s. Um, are there any similarities between what was happening then and how people reacted to what is happening today and how people reacted? And Emma, I'll give you a shot at that same question. Michael, first you. Yeah, so I have done work on <clears throat> the, the so-called Spanish flu of 1918, which didn't come from Spain. Um, uh, trying, trying to work out questions like where did it come from? Uh, uh, was it circulating under the radar for uh, months or even years before it was recognized in 1918? Uh, and it's, a, it's actually a, a shockingly close parallel to what we're going through right now. That pandemic probably killed uh, about 1% of, uh, of the population, so worldwide, probably 50 million people, mostly through the fall of 1918 and spring of 1919. Uh, this current pandemic has the capability of doing that, but we are doing things like these lockdown measures, uh, uh, wearing masks uh, and, and other sort of blunt uh, tools that, that nonetheless work. Uh, that, that are similar to what was done in 1918. Uh, and uh, it's just, it's very interesting to look back on how that pandemic really rolled across the human population all across the world very quickly. Um, and, and then as Emma, I, I, I know, uh, knows very well, didn't leave much of a historical mark compared to, um, other events like World War I that had just finished and killed actually fewer people. Mm -hmm. Wow, so Emma, what, uh, what's missing in the historical narrative of what happened in 1918? Who's missing? I think everything's missing. I mean, I think Michael's correct. It's, I'm, I really commend him for having conducted some research because we really don't have very many uh, books, articles, documents about the Spanish flu. Um, 1918. And I wonder how much of that has to do with, I mean, it's interesting how history works and, and the, the purposes of historical erasure, right? But I'm not sure this was so much historical erasure as just the, the, the fact that World War I was, was massive and the, the ways in which it affected so many people in so many communities in ways that, that a war had never done before or that hadn't been remembered in that way before. So it seems as if it just sidestepped the impact of the Spanish flu of, of 1918. I mean, there were, there's a few books, I think I was telling you, there's, you know, Catherine Porter, uh, what's her name, Catherine Ann Porter wrote Pale Rider, um, I think in, after she herself suffered the, the, the Spanish flu. And there really isn't even that much literature. Do you think so that it was just a kind of, you know, uh, death was all around us and people mm -hmm. had fatigue, they had death fatigue. Uh, what do you think, Michael? It is, could that be one of the reasons that history just kind of wanted to push that whole episode aside? That, that was part of it. And actually there's an important component uh, of uh, press censorship. So this, uh, this really started toward the end of World War I and one of the reasons that we call it Spanish flu is because Spain was one of the few countries that wasn't involved in World War I and didn't put, put a kind of lockdown on, uh, on the press with bad news. In the other countries where people started dying from Spanish flu, uh, including the United States, 
uh, newspapers were not allowed to report on it. Um, and, and I think that's part of the story here, uh, which, which is different uh, than, than what we're experiencing now. What, uh, Emma, could we learn from that era, that horrible era in our country's history that we might be able to take advantage of now? I mean, we're, we're through a, a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. um, what lessons have we learned? Do we ever learn lessons is the question, right? I mean, I think that that history has, historical documents have so much to offer us. And when I say documents, I don't just mean the archive, the traditional archive. I mean people's memories, oral tradition, the places that we don't usually go. And I think Michael is, when Michael points out that the newspapers were censored, um, think of the difference today when we have so much social media. And um, that I think is already a distinction. But I think not just the fact that the newspapers weren't allowed to report, I think that, that a difference too for today is that if you don't have the documents, I mean, people have mostly relied on newspapers in the, 20, in the early 20th century. And if it's being censored, then where do we go? We can go to people, how many people are really talking about it? I mean, I talked to my mother recently and she remembered that her grandfather um, had had died of of the of the Spanish flu so it's it's a different kind of archive right whereas today there is an explosion of information with as a result of social media and as a result of the traditional you know the newspapers then we can watch television we have we have so many avenues now to get information and so much inf it's information explosion. So that then what really begins to happen is how do we decipher that? How do we get through that? How do we know what's true and what isn't true? What are the alternative facts, so to speak, that were thrown at us when? Well, there's some similarities with today, aren't there? Uh, about facts, about science. There's mm -hmm. uh, similarities in terms of what is true, what is not mm -hmm. true, what is perception. Uh, Michael, uh, do you see some similarities with that? You're talking about how Spain was one of the few countries that did not censor its media. But here in this country, the media is not censored, but maybe the media, certain forms of the media, are offering alternative facts that aren't necessarily based in science. Uh, yeah, this is a pervasive problem. Um, and, and it's not just the media, the federal government uh, has, has made some, some missteps uh, in not taking this as seriously as they should have early on. Um, and so there are, are just some clear uh, opportunities that were lost that some of my current research ties into in terms of, so when, when did the epidemic actually really take root uh, in the United States? Um, and, and some early thinking uh, suggested that actually the very first diagnosed patient back in January uh, of this year who arrived in, in Seattle may have established a chain of, of transmission right at that point. And if that had been the case, um, it really would have been a situation where it was really too, too early for testing uh, uh, community members to try to find those early seeds of infection and, and root them out with contact tracing and isolation. Uh, it probably would have been too early. Uh, some of my research is indicating that maybe actually that that initial infection in mid-January did not establish uh, the the community transmission that we thought it did, and that didn't happen until a few weeks later. At which point, some of the the missteps in the CDC deciding to develop its own uh, test for the virus rather than using one that had already been developed elsewhere, uh, the FDA. Um, mm -hmm being quite um, conservative about uh, allowing labs like research labs to actually start testing stored specimens for the virus. Um, th those uh, decisions start to become potentially more important in not shutting the door on the virus when we had a bit of a chance uh, like other countries like South Korea and Iceland uh, were able to do. 
by the time the virus reached Southern California, and we heard a lot about the ships coming on board, we heard a lot about the nursing home situations in Southern California. Would that have been a time to begin the contact tracing? I know that there was some done, but the emphasis wasn't really on, on contact tracing, was it? Yeah, so, so the contact tracing is, is really the second step uh, in, in the chain. And the first step is you got to find the people in the community who are infected. Uh, and so this was one of the, the, the things that, uh, that we kind of fumbled. We, we only started uh, for, for basically January and February. We were really only testing people who were flying in from China or who had been in contact with someone known to, to have the infection. Uh, and you need to start testing widely in the community to actually find community transmission. You talk about fumbling. Uh, Emma, things have been really fumbled with communities of color, haven't they? What, what do you see now that is happening in these communities that is disturbing to you at this point? Well, I think it's, I think if we look at it historically, this has been the case. I mean, we can go back to the Spanish conquest, right? And who are, the, what's the population that was most affected by the conquest and colonization? And we lost what um, estimates are five to eight million indigenous people, right? From smallpox and other things, but certainly from this epidemic. And so isn't it interesting that if we move into the 21st century, then we see once again, which are the populations that are being most affected. I mean, I think that um, you're probably familiar with the book, Michael, by, by uh, Frank Snowden, right? On epidemics and, yeah. and society and how he says that um, there's ways in which social structures have allowed these diseases to flourish. And that's an interesting concept. That's an interesting thing to wrap your head around because you, you begin to think, okay, so what is the purpose of this? And who is it that gets wiped out? And who get, you know, who or what is the collateral damage? And if we look at issues of race, class, gender, sexualities, who's at the bottom of the rung? Once again, it's, it's you know, there's a reason why Black Lives Matter is, is so important and prominent right now. And there's a reason why, um, why there's an explosion on the streets. And I'm really, I really commend our, our young people for what they're doing, because th this, is a, this is a moment when they themselves could die. So what does that mean? If they themselves, they're taking their lives in their hands and they're saying, what do we have to lose? And I think historically, we know this. If we look at protest, strike activity, protest movements through the centuries, what we see is that when people, usually poor people, of various ethnicities, black, brown, indigenous, when they have so little to lose, then they're ready to go on the streets. And I think we're in that historic moment once again. Do you see that some similarities there, Michael? Oh yeah, so, so, so this virus is uh, disproportionately hitting in particularly black people uh, in our tribal communities. Um, and, uh, and that opens up from scientific perspective a lot of questions, um, and and so um, I, I, there there are a lot of reasons that could be, um, and, and some of it probably does have to do with uh, some higher levels of underlying uh, health conditions like hypertension, for example, uh, which in turn actually you can look uh, at the historical uh, picture uh, and understand that. Um, those health outcomes actually themselves are the uh, outcome of, of uh, historical events in the country. Uh, I think there's also a big component probably of, of just exposure. I, I don't think like the, the increased uh, death rate, for example, of, of uh, black people in places like Atlanta from this virus right now, I don't think you can explain it all by un underlying health conditions. Uh, it probably is also being driven by exposure. So people in jobs where they don't have the luxury of, of sitting at home and recording uh, something on Zoom, they have to go to the grocery store or drive the truck that goes to the grocery store and put themselves uh, in harm's way. So, so these, are, these are really important uh, aspects. And to some degree, you can get at this with the, with the scientific uh, data. 
Well, you see the meatpacking uh, companies that lost many, many people. Uh, most of those have Latinos have uh, working in them. Emma, what does that tell you about the state of our society? Uh, many of these meatpacking companies were ordered by this administration to get back to work, reopen, we need that meat. And all the while people were dying. Yeah, I mean, once again, we're looking at these social structures that um, take priority, profit over people, right? And we definitely have an administration right now that is openly doing this. I mean, neoliberal institutions do it as well, but it's so open right now. And it's, this is, again, that's why there are so many protests on the streets, finally. But I think what what we look at is that, and what we see repeatedly throughout history is what, who are the populations that seem to be expendable, right? And if you have larger population of Latinx, many of whom are immigrants, by the way, uh, working in the meatpacking industry and in the Midwest, um, I think that they're, they, they, they're expendable, right? There's more where that came from. And we've known that when we see um, the, the manner in which immigration from Mexico and from the from Central America and South America has, has um, come into the United States and when they get pushed out and deported once again when there's when there is an economic depression I mean we saw that in the 20 early 20th century um, in the 1920s there was an economic economic boom and the same steel industries that recruited and went deliberately to Mexico to bring workers are the same ones that put them on the trains in the 1930s uh, as a result of the depression. So once again, we're talking about who's, which populations are expendable. And Michael, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I mean, inevitably we see it's indigenous, it's the Latinx, it's black communities, it's poor communities who don't have access um, to- and, and if I could just jump in there, Emma, um, uh, our, our, our elders, the, the, the elderly people in this country uh, many of whom are in uh, long-term care facilities uh, where they don't have the ability to move somewhere else if there's a, a, an outbreak, uh, of course, are also at, at very high risk. And, and that's why, um, to, to sort of switch over to some good news, um, you know, it, it, I, I'm, I'm excited about the possibilities of turning the tide of the pandemic with measures like mask wearing um, and there's been some really bad confusion that the CDC the, 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 the um, <clears throat> CDC's advice on mask wearing early on was for, for regular folks don't wear masks and and it was really a fear that there wouldn't be enough personal protective equipment for healthcare workers that led to public health messaging that was essentially wrong that the masks actually, are a gift that you give to the people around you. you. You don't want to think of them so much as something that's going to make you bomb proof when you go out in public. Mm -hmm. It's uh, that if you're one of those people who's potentially transmitting the virus before you even feel sick, um, you're protecting the person in line at the grocery store or the, or the, or the cashier uh, person at the grocery store from catching the virus uh, and uh, and I think, I think there's a lot of um, scope for that measure in particular, allowing us to have both, where, where you don't have a public health disaster and you don't take down the economy. So, so I, I, I hope that will happen. And I hope that we can move the conversation from, um, from masks being thought of as uh, something that people are doing for, the, for themselves to something that they're doing for uh, the person in the long-term care facility that's one link in the chain away from them. But the wearing of masks has also been very politicized. If you wear a, a, a mask, you are anti this current administration. Is that a dangerous kind of message that's going out there to the community? And, and I've heard many, um, many medical people, many researchers, scientists, all very credible who say, this is not an issue of politics. This is an issue of public health. Emma, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it is an issue of public health and, and Michael brought raised some really good points. I think that the interesting thing about um, 
wearing a mask is that it is it is a kind of communal way of saying, um, look, I care. And and as I walk around, um, when I go to the market or when even when I go jogging and I see the people who aren't wearing masks, then I think, what is the misinformation that people are getting that you don't, that, that community isn't important, right? Because I think if people really recognize that, that community, that this is about affecting a community and affecting other people, I think they would be more likely to do so. I, uh, I agree with that. Yeah, I think they would. And I think, I mean, I like to err on the side of hope and, and that there's a goodness in people, despite what's happening in, in, um, in the uh, political administration that we, that we have right now. I still think that I see a lot of hope. And I think, I think that we have to turn a corner with this because it can get worse, right? It can definitely get worse. And it is political. Public health is political, right? People don't- It always has say, been. Yeah, they want to separate these things out, but isn't it obvious who is being affected more? Who has Michael, access to healthcare? One of the things that I keep seeing surfacing in news accounts and people on, on social media who are saying, well, I can't wear a mask. Uh, it's not healthy for me to wear a mask. One pregnant woman said, if I wear a mask, that could potentially harm my child because all sorts of germs are, are getting in there and that could wind up in my bloodstream, it could wind up harming my child. Can you separate fact from fiction on the realities of wearing a mask? Is Can it be dangerous for some people? Um, it's, it's hard for me to think of uh, an example where an otherwise healthy person who would be in a public place where you, where you would hope that they would wear a mask uh, would be harmed by wearing the mask, uh, and and uh, and those. If if a person's concerned about germs coming from their own mouth, um, again, the the hope is that people will just make that one little switch in their mind from this mask is not about me, it's, and it's certainly not an expression uh, of my own fear of the virus, which I think some people m might. Uh, uh, want to uh, not um, display any any kind of suggestion that they themselves are scared of the virus and therefore are wearing a mask. But again, if people could realize that it's about the people that you're interacting with, and it, importantly, those people down the chain of transmission who can't get out of the way uh, of this uh, virus. You know, we're we're sitting right now in this this kind of incredible perfect storm. We have uh, political unrest, we have racial unrest, we have public health unrest. All these things are coming together. How is that impacting the world around us? How is that impacting our humanity, Emma? I, again, you know, I err on the side of hope. I think that all of the protest, the waking up, uh, the kind of consciousness that is being, um, that is just rising. I think that that we're at a pivotal moment. And historically, I didn't think I would be alive to see such a thing because I'm in my 60s now, right? And I remember the 70s and the hope of the 70s and that kind, the 60s and 70s and that kind of revolution that was occurring. And a lot of good things happened, but there were also a lot of mistakes. And I think what is different about this moment is so much at once, so much is happening at once. And we have a young generation that is frustrated and ready for the change because they see the hypocrisy and they see the lies and they're ready for a different kind of community, a different kind of society that's more egalitarian instead of pretending to be egalitarian. So I think it's a pivotal moment and I see hope at the end of this. Uh, of course, it's a day-to-day -day thing right? I mean, we all have to contribute in some way. It does, it's not just some amorphous thing out there that's going to happen. How are we all going to contribute? I think one of the ways is we all wear masks for one, I mean, for one thing, right? Right. Michael, um, uh, sometimes the, I guess the narrative is shaped by what's happening today. But how has this narrative from a scientific uh, perspective changed even in the past two months, the narrative is different, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
Do you mean for the, the pandemic? Yeah, for the pandemic itself, you know, the, the dangers involved, not the dangers involved, open the, the, uh, the government, open, you know, our economy. The narrative keeps changing. How does that impact how scientists see what you have to do? Yeah, so, so we're in a situation where um, you have to come at it with some humility uh, and, and actually be transparent about what you do and don't know from a scientific perspective. Uh, and going back to 1918, the one thing that was really clear was that not, not giving the straight goods to people and actually squaring with them when there was evidence that this was something that was really, really dangerous uh, was, was disastrous. Uh, and, and so as scientists, uh, what we're trying to do is, is work things out uh, as best we can as this thing unfolds um, and, and then try to communicate what we do find. And it's not a surprise that there have been uh, some areas of confusion. You know, what is the true infection fatality rate? Of all the people who get infected with this, how many are gonna die? Um, that's actually turning out to be a difficult thing to calculate and it's not the same in every community. Um, do asymptomatic people transmit the virus? And if so, how much of the uh, trans uh, transmission in the whole pandemic is due to them, which then in turn it affects your decision about mask wearing. We're trying to figure these things out uh, on the fly. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think it can be somewhat disconcerting for people outside of the scientific or the academic world uh, where we kind of do this as a matter of course and try to uh, test hypotheses, shoot down our own ideas if data suggests they should be shot down. Uh, I think it can be a bit disturbing to people outside of that world to see this happening in real time, but it's also kind of cool uh, to, to, to sort of unveil the process and, and, and show how it works. And in the scientific community uh, and, 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 the, and the historical community, um, good scientists, good historians, good researchers of all types are interested in what's really going on rather than what they want to have going on. There you go. Emma, yeah. any comments yeah. on that? I love that last statement, Michael, because it's like, where, what are the truths? And people use facts to, um, to confirm their beliefs, right? Rather than looking for what the truths really are. And, and so much of it is about interpretation and how is this being, I mean, we're at a moment where at, we're interpreting just as it happens. And there's so much information and misinformation out there. And of course, we haven't had a lot of leadership, unfortunately. So that's problematic. That's been incredibly what, problematic. What is it about that messaging that is so critical, both in a scientific sense and a historical sense that, uh, and you mentioned, you touched on it a little bit, Michael, where um, you, you got to square up with the public, you got to be truthful with them. When different versions of the same uh, incident is out there, what does that do to our community? Either um, one of you. Sh shall I take that, Emma? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so different differences of opinion uh, can be healthy. Um, mm -hmm. But but some, sometimes there are um, you know transparently political uh, attempts to really not get at the truth uh, and and to to actually sidestep it. And again, in in public health, those are those are really dangerous. Uh, and and so you know it's easy to it's easy to uh, take pot shots at people who are making decisions. Um, there have been decisions that haven't been great, um, even in the even in the state of Arizona, um, and we're now in a situation where I really didn't want us to be, um, you know, two two months ago. Uh, and for those of us who work on viral pandemics and public health, um, it, it was somewhat predictable uh, 
that we would be in this situation. But then I'm, I'm hopeful that we're seeing uh, pivots away from some of those um, uh, decisions. For, for example, the governor not allowing local uh, officials to make decisions on mask wearing. I think that was a great decision. Uh, I applaud that, and and uh, and I think that kind of thing can can make a, a, a huge difference. And so I I I look forward to six months from now. I think six months from now we're going to be, with regard to the pandemic, uh, in a much better place. Um, there are. Uh, therapies like monoclonal antibodies, which are kind of a tricky way of, of kind of copying what our own bodies do uh, to make an immune response, uh, but, but put it in a bottle and, and give it as a shot. Some of those therapies might come along uh, even, even next fall uh, and begin to really transform how momentarily hopeless uh, things seem. And so um, I, I I, I'm hopeful that uh, six months from now, if we have a similar conversation, we'll be able to look back at a lot of good decisions that, that were made as well. Well, we've come to the end of, of this particular conversation. And let me give you both a chance to maybe leave behind a final message from your own perspectives. If you want people to walk away with any one thing from your perspective, Emma, what is it? Oh, there's so much to say. I mean, I think that um, I link all of this to what's happening globally, right? I mean, I think COVID is so much a part of, of the protest, so much a part of the unrest that we're seeing right now, so much a part of the way uh, there is this massive global uprising, right? And I think that I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful about what it all means. And I think I hope that in six months we can look back the way Michael says, but, but I'm hopeful about transformation. I think we are at a moment when we can really transform ourselves and our communities and be more, it's as if we're being challenged right now. How much do you really care for other people? Are we still going to be individualist or ego driven, profit driven, or do we care for a community? And I think that's, isn't it interesting that, that, that there's this metaphor of a mask to sort of show that to us and it, and it, and it extends to every other arena of our lives, I believe. Michael, uh, something you want people to remember from this conversation? Yeah, and, and it's uh, a little bit of a cliche, uh, but we, and it just builds on Emma's last point that we are all in, in this together, that, that um, a public health emergency is not something that happens uh, on an individual level. Uh, the, and, and that cuts both ways. It means that decisions that we make as individuals can bring great harm if we, if we make uh, decisions that put other, uh, others at risk. But it also means that collectively, we actually have a tremendous amount of power um, and this pandemic, I think, has made people feel a lot of fear and a lot of powerlessness. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think my message would be that um, actually we, we can do a, a huge amount uh, against this common enemy, this, this pathogen, uh, if we work together. And I, I, I think we're going to see more of that. Well, thank you both, uh, Emma Perez. Uh, Dr. Emma Perez and Dr. Michael, let's see if I get it right, Michael, Warby, did I get it? Nailed it. Uh, you know, I want to give you an L in there someplace. A lot of people <laughs> Thank do. You, both. you can, you can yeah. give me an L if you want. Thank you. Uh, okay, you Thank got you. it. Thank you both. I really appreciate it. And folks who are watching this will be back uh, in a time in the future with yet another conversation. Thanks for joining us. Thank you both. Thank you. It was a pleasure.